I can't see. As I always do. Okay, just had to switch the mic on. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, all right, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Islands of Resistance. So as you guys all know, this is a solidarity panel discussing the U.S. imperialist legacy of the Treaty of Paris on the Philippines, Guam, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. My name is... I'm like looking at them. My name is Ari. <laughs> uh, my name is Ari Zanelli. I'm one of the co-moderators. I am a member of Night Chirp and chair of the Education Committee for Night Chirp. Hi, I'm Oscar. Hi, my name is Jorge Cruz. I'll be the other co-moderator here, and I'm with uh, New York Beacon Resistance. I'm the Solidarity Officer. So both of our organizations are part of an alliance called the ILPS, the International League of People Struggles, which is an anti-imperialist alliance of democratic mass organizations around the world. ILPS is made up of many grassroots orgs, and we encourage folks in the room or online uh, to consider supporting our work by donating. So this evening, funds will be sent to our NYCHA finance officer, Jay Saturai. So you can Venmo Jonathan at Jay Saturai. Um, or we do have QR codes at the front near registration. Basically, all donations are honorarium. So they will go to each of the respective organizations and then ILPS as well. Um, and you can do that after with Emily or Ethan who are tabling in the front over there. So uh, we're coming new live here at the People's Forum, our gracious hosts for the evening and for our in-person participation, for our in-person participants, we welcome you to enjoy the snacks and drinks. Uh, please visit the tables over there. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the restrooms are located right here in the back. And for our friends online, we'll try our best to moderate the chat to get any questions you may have for our Q&A portion at the end of our program. Uh, we also like to plug in real quick uh, that we have a land acknowledgement. So before we go any further, we would like to do a land acknowledgement. So this ground that this ground which we walk upon today, the land that we currently occupy, the caretakers of this land, the Lenape tribe, have been here for over 10,000 years and counting. So it consists of sub-tribes, Munsi, Unami, Unlak, Tigo, in today's conversation, which will touch on the topics of sovereignty, self-determination, democracy, and basic human rights, we recognize our occupation of their land and acknowledge the similar struggles that may mirror some what you may hear about tonight. We honor the centuries-long struggle of the Lenape people for their own right to self-determination, for the right to their land that was stolen from them by the Dutch, and for the right to have their history, past, present, and future fully recognized and celebrated. We also acknowledge that a land acknowledgement, though with good intentions, is just that, an acknowledgement. So some ways we can be in solidarity, support, and empower current living members of these tribes here today. For the Lenape, we encourage folks to support the Lenape Cultural Center, which was founded in 2009. It's actually led by Lenape elders. Their mission is to continue building Lenape Hoking through community, culture, and the arts. And while we are not on their land at this moment, another indigenous tribe support should be the Chinook Nation and out of Long, out on Long Island, New York. Uh, a most recent campaign of theirs is to urge New York Governor Kathy Hochul to sign the Unmarked Burial Site Protection Act into law. Uh, currently, private developers have unfettered discretion, discretion to destroy grave sites without fear of reprisal. Federal and New York state laws as they currently exist do not apply to, hand, to lands held privately. Uh, this 
law would close the gap in an otherwise significant body of enforcement that has paved the way for the appropriate handling of sacred sites and human remains. Uh, lastly, we'd like to mention the missing and murdered indigenous peoples crisis. For decades, Native American communities have struggled with high rates of assault, abduction, and murder of women, and we believe this deserves everyone's attention. So to kick off the evening, we're so excited to share with you all an open cultural offering from Mike Legospi from Bion USA. Mike Legospi is a Filipino language instructor, writer, and community organizer who has been active in the Philippine National Democratic Movement throughout the last decade. He began organizing militant and anti-imperialist Filipino youth with Anak Bayan and later advocating for the rights and welfare of Filipino migrant workers with Migrante. His first book of poems, Half Remembered Dreams of a Third World Son, was just published three weeks ago and includes reflections. Yeah. His book includes reflections on his life, having migrated to the U.S. in his teens. So let's welcome Mike to the stage. Okay, there. Can you all hear me? Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike. Um, most of what Ari said is true. I think. <laughs> um, and I'm here tonight to uh, share uh, uh, a little bit of uh, a few words and a little bit of poetry. Um, not from the book, actually, uh, but something that I'd written uh, much more recently when I found out that um, uh, an amazing revolutionary hero and, um, and poet was killed uh, by the Marcos Duterte regime in the Philippines. Um, Erickson Acosta, a longtime student activist also, and he, he became a labor uh, organizer as well as uh, went to the countryside to organize uh, the majority of the, of the Philippines' uh, uh, poor peasant farmers um, against landlord exploitation and foreign uh, uh, government, um, uh, sorry, foreign corporate domination uh, was murdered by the state forces of the Marcos uh, uh, regime. So, you know, I'd like to dedicate this, uh, uh, this reading uh, to him, but also to everybody who has been fighting for, uh, for rights, welfare, and sovereignty for all indigenous peoples around the world, for all um, people exploited under the capitalist imperialist system uh, currently, and of course for the many people, including the people in this room, as well as the people back in many of our home countries, uh, fighting back to end it. So um, I had to double check that I have the notebook actually. Okay, so this is for this is for everyone, and this is also for Erickson Acosta. There is a heartbeat in the grass, deep and soft and swaying with the wind like a barrio cat or a guerrilla fighter. There is a heartbeat in the rain, endless tears falling like a sheet, 10 million sparkling stars. We catch them and laugh or we catch them and we cry. They fall from the sky just the same. There is a heartbeat in the moonlight. The silent prayers of every parent that their child will grow and see a brighter day. Some parents take to the forests and mountains to create this brighter day. Some youths follow those whispered prayers. Into the dark of the tall grass they rush to help pull the brighter day into reality. There is a heartbeat in the trees. As those who fight daily for justice and peace watch the world in all its tragedy, in all its beauty, thinking one day their heartbeats will cease. They are wrong. 
They are right to fight. They are right to dream. And they are always, always right to rebel. But they are wrong about their own heartbeats. A freedom fighter's heartbeat lasts forever, challenging the longevity of time itself. So long as the people believe, and so long as the people need, there will forever be a heartbeat in the revolution. Mabuhay Erickson Acosta, long live international solidarity, long live the people's resistance. Thank you. We're doing this for the people on the live stream. Thank you, Mike. That was a really awesome poem. So what is the Treaty of Paris? <clears throat> to start off, I'm going to read this poem. I think all of us know this poem. Um, in 1899, uh, Rudyard Kipling published a poem in the pop popular London-based newspaper, The Times, and it began. Take up the white man's burden. Send forth the best ye breed. Go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives' need. To wait in heavy harness on flutter folk and wild, your new caught sullen peoples, half devil and half child. Titled The White Man's Burden, it was Kipling's urgent appeal to the United States to join the old monarchies of Western Central Europe in their imperialist robbery of the world. The captives, sullen peoples and, ha and half devil, half children, were Filipino indigenous land defenders currently fighting US occupiers. It was not only Kipling who saw the Spanish-American War as an opportunity for the United States. Uh, business tycoons saw the U.S. coming out of a recession with greater prospects of underselling foreign competitors and monopolies developing in railroads by Vanderbilt, steel and iron by Carnegie, and international banking by Morgan. Though the weight of public opinion was against the war with Spain, war hawks in Congress firmly in the pockets of U.S. business found the proper excuse behind the sink behind the sinking of the USS Maine. Debates swirled on whether the ship had sunk as a result of an internal malfunction or by an outside explosion in Havana Harbor. But nonetheless, yellow journalism on the part of the New York Times had swung the debate into a pro-war position with anti-Spanish sentiment skyrocketing amongst Americans. Prior to the sinking of the US Maine and later US occupation, Guam, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Cuba fell under the Spanish colonial umbrella with various revolutionary movements occurring with each island nation. In Puerto Rico, after decades of revolts, 1897 brought independence, only to be overturned a few months later when U.S. warships bombed San Juan. The Philippine Revolution started in 1896 against the Spanish Empire, which upon the Spaniards' loss of the Spanish-American War became a revolution against the U.S. occupation. And surely before the treaty signing, the Chamorro people of Guahan had endured centuries of missionary violence at the hands of the Spaniards and had their land, their island turned over to the American warships without resistance from the local Spanish militia. The Treaty of Paris was signed by the United States and Spain, formally ending the Spanish-American War. Now with the treaty signing, America was given Guam, the Philippines, Cuba, and Puerto Rico, all former colonies of Spain. It is around this time we see the rise of imperialism, so with the U.S. carving its niche in the world. As financial capital grew, so did the need for raw materials to drive other colonies, for other colonies. The wars of aggression carried out throughout the 20th century are a direct result of the American colonial expansion, which was furthered during the Spanish-American War. All right, now without further ado, you didn't come here to listen to us. You came here to listen to our panelists over here. 
So <laughs> let's start off with our first panelist. So today we have Nico Kabanayan representing Anak Bayan Queens. Uh, Nico is an artist, musician, and youth organizer. Is currently chairperson of Anak Bayan Queens, a local chapter of an overseas movement of youth and student organizations fighting for national democracy with a socialist perspective in the Philippines. So without further ado. Hello. Hi. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Philippines and the impact of the Treaty of Paris on the Philippines. Um, this is like over 500 years of history, so I'm going to try to get it all in there, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll do our best. Um, so just for context, um, the Philippines is an archipelago, um, so it has over 7,000 islands, um, 134 ethnic groups, and over 120 languages. Um, it's also incredibly rich in natural resources, um, such as copper, wood, and gold. Um, so starting uh, with the Spanish colonial period in um, 1521, um, we had the Portuguese uh, Ferdinand Magellan, um, who claimed the Philippines for Spain. Um, a month later, uh, Lapu Lapu killed him in the Battle of Mactan, which, yeah, <laughs> we, we, we love that for us. Um, and then uh, in 1896, um, we have Andres Bonifacio, who led the Katipunan, a uh, revolutionary group um, to revolt against Spanish colonial rule in the Philippines, um, beginning the Philippine Revolution. Um, ultimately, he was executed for treason under orders from Emilio Aguinaldo, um, the leader of the Katipunan's Magdalo faction, um, who was a puppet of the U.S. In 1898, um, as our comrade said, uh, we have the Spanish-American War, right? Um, we see in the mock battle of Manila Bay, this false battle where Spain staged a loss uh, to U.S. military forces um, so that they could quietly exit without, you know, embarrassment to them. Um, Aguinaldo declared Philippine independence and also pledged allegiance to U.S. Admiral Dewey and U.S. Generals Merritt and Williams. Um, and then we have the Treaty of Paris. Um, Spain ceded the Philippines to the U.S., um, and the Philippines was a prime location for the U.S. even back then because, like I said, of the natural resources, the raw materials, um, as well as cheap labor and its strategic location in the Pacific. After that, we see the Philippine-American War. Um, over uh, 600 U.S. teachers arrived in the Philippines to set up these colonial public schools um, to destroy the Filipino nationalist and revolutionary spirit. That war ended in 1913, but the U.S. remained. Um, they maintained feudalism in the Philippines to ensure access to those raw materials and cheap labor. Um, and formerly Spanish-owned haciendas were bought by the U.S. and given to local big landlords to maintain that positive relationship between them. And then with the uh, World War II, um, we saw the Japanese invasion of the Philippines. Um, the U.S. Uh, was occupied with fighting in Europe at this time, and U.S. government officials quietly exited the Philippines uh, for the U.S., while U.S. generals surrendered their forces to the Japanese. Um, for the Filipinos, um, some bureaucrat capitalists escaped to the U.S. as well, while others sided with the Japanese and became part of a puppet government. Um, but we also see that um, the original Communist Party of the Philippines um, that was founded in 1930 um, established the Hukbalahap, the People's Army, against the Japanese. Um, they led guerrilla warfare against Japanese military in the northern Philippines in Luzon. Um, oops. In 1945, um, between February and March, the U.S. Um, fought against Japanese, but um, what ended up actually happening, what they actually did was they bombed the Philippines um, during the Battle of Manila. They destroyed the local economy um, to ensure that the Philippines remained dependent on the U.S., taking on high-interest loans for so-called development. Um, and then in August of 1945, um, Japan, Japan surrendered, um, so World War II ended. Um, in 1946, on July 4th, uh, the U.S. 
supposedly granted uh, independence to the Philippines, right? Um, they also uh, signed a treaty of general relations to ensure that U.S. property rights um, were to be maintained as before. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that every president of the Philippines that has ever existed has always put profits of foreign corporations and the ruling elite over the needs of the people. Um, we see that in, almost immediately. In 1947, um, President Manuel Rojas signed the U.S. military bases agreement, allowing 22 U.S. military bases to be built in the Philippines. In 1951, we see the mutual defense treaty signed by President Quirino, um, agreeing to mutually defend each other's territory. In 1964, we also see another uh, rise in revolutionary movements, right? So we see the Kabata Ang Makabayan, the Patriotic Youth Forum, um, founded by young students, workers, professionals, and peasants. Um, Marcos became president um, in 1965, um, but we also saw that in the late 60s, the modern Communist Party of the Philippines founded, as well as the New People's Army. And then in 1970, we saw the first quarter storm where widespread rallies and demonstrations against Marcos and U.S. control, uh, many of which were led by KM, um, took place in the streets. Um, in 1970, we also saw the formation of a, women's, a patriotic women's organization founded called Makibaka. In 1972, Marcos declared martial law. Um, the public explanation for this was to quell the growing communist movement, but it was clearly to suppress anti-Marco demonstrations. Um, KM and Makibaka were forced underground, and the U.S. maintained support for the Philippine government. But in 1986, we saw the popular uh, people power uprising um, oust Marcos. Cory Aquino became president. Uh, literally, like three days later, Ronald Reagan uh, formally withdrew his support of the Marcoses, and the Marcoses escaped to Hawaii. Um, in the modern era, we see that in 1991, uh, the um, naval bases were closed because of a people's movement. Um, but the Balakitan military exercises began that same year, um, where U.S. military exchanged tactics with Philippine military. Um, in 1999, um, the Visiting Forces Agreement was signed, allowing U.S. military to enter freely into the Philippines uh, for activities approved by the government. Um, and so we see these patterns um, happening over and over again, um, including now where we see, uh, you know, the uh, current Philippine government, Marcos and Duterte, um, buddying up with Biden and Kamala Harris. Um, but I think what's important to note, and I know that I'm like over time now, <laughs> um, I think it's important to note that, you know, despite everything that, you know, has ever been thrown at us as a people, uh, that we have always continued to resist. We have always found ways to resist, um, you know, despite the fact that there's a current counterinsurgency campaign against us now, you know, uh, people are still finding ways to um, resist and expose the truth um, even here in the U.S. So, yeah, thank you. Wow, Nico, you ran a, you ran what we call PSR <laughs> in five minutes. <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, so our next panelist is a, uh, is a guest that's joining us virtually. Um, so really thankful because this person is going to be speaking on the history of Guam. Michael Luan Pevacua is from the Cabeza and Bitot clans of Guam and Guahan and currently works as a curator for the Guam Museum. He taught Chamorro language and culture at the University of Guam for 10 years and continues to offer free Zoom language classes each weekend for those wanting to learn the language and culture of the indigenous people of Guam and the Mariana Islands. He's a member of Guam's Commission on Decolonization and is a co-chair for the Decolonization Community Outreach Group, Independent Guahan. Thank you so much for, for having me. Here it is. It is an honor to be on a panel with uh, others, and um, it's important that we create spaces for this type of solidarity to share stories with each other. And so, I'm happy to share with you this, some stories from of the Chamorro people and of Guam. And so, Guam is an imperial afterthought for the United States. Sort of Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines are all very sort of, uh, you know. Uh, lucrative properties. There's a lot of economic interest, geopolitical interest in them. Guam's value for the United States in 1898 remains the same today. It is strategic military importance. Guam is taken 
by Henry Glass on the way to the Philippines to go and join the fight against the Spanish. It is taken in a bloodless overthrow of the Spanish because the Spanish had no idea that the Spanish on Guam had no idea that America and Spain were at war at that point because there was no regular communication with the island. And so when Henry Glass had fired a warning shot in the harbor, um, the Spanish governor had assumed that that was like a salute because Americans like their guns. They like to make things go boom. And so Guam is quickly taken. The United States, to sort of help make clear the military importance of Guam, a civilian government is not set up. A military government is set up on the island, and it rules the island for the next 50 years. Uh, and so this naval government had com complete control over the lives of the indigenous people, the Chamorros. The naval governor could pass any law that they wanted to. They could throw anybody in jail for any reason. And across those 50 years, their stories of one Navy governor banning whistling because he was from the southern part of the United States. The U.S. brought segregation to Guam and his one of and his wife had been whistled at by a brown native. And that was the end of all humanity. And so whistling was banned in the capital. And at least one Chamorro, according to the stories, was thrown in jail for daring to whistle when the naval governor had said no whistling. One of the main things sort of that affected the people at that time too, similar to what Native Americans experiencing was that the US Navy banned the speaking of the Chamorro language in schools, punishing children, making them pay fines so that if you were caught speaking Chamorro, whatever money you had brought for lunch was taken, making you wear signs saying that you're stupid, making you eat soap or drink castor oil if you speak the language. Now, the when the World War II hits Guam, the Japanese occupy it for 32 months and they bring a lot of brutality into the island. Uh, one in every 20 Chamorros is killed in that um, through forced labor, uh, through massacres and so on. When the United States returns to the island, um, you know, they return as a quote unquote liberator of the island, taking it back. And for a short period from 44 to 49, there is a strong emphasis on the United States turning Guam into Fortress Guam. So on an island of 22,000 people, um, over the next few years, now remember the Japanese occupation, which was brutal and horrible, is over. America has returned. The Chamorros welcomed America back, um, hoping that this would return to normalcy. But instead, the United States displaces two-thirds of the island, takes land from two-thirds of the, uh, uh, takes two-thirds of the entire island, forcing thousands of families off their land to create military bases. And... Um, the most sort of uh, appalling stories of that are military officers in their nice white suits going into villages. And if they find a nice little area, they just point at it and then they say, take that. And so there's one story that the uh, a naval admiral saw some really nice fruit trees in an area. And he said, take all of this for officer housing. This is ours now. And then and within a week, bulldozers come in, destroy the farms, push the families off their land. 1950 represents a big change because the U.S. Navy had created such a scandal in the way that it had treated the Chamorro people that the, the Soviet Union and other countries were condemning the United States in the, United, in the new United Nations. There was uh, letters to the editor across the United States uh, basically condemning what the Navy was doing. And so the Truman administration decided to solve the problem by by getting rid of the Navy government, but still keeping most of the land in federal control and transferring it to the U.S. Navy, but setting up a civilian government on the island. Prior to this period, Chamorros are not U.S. citizens. After 1950, Chamorros become U.S. citizens. But no voting representatives in the U.S. Congress, um, no votes for president, um, and sort of, and, and the U.S. military it's a very sweet deal in Guam in terms of being able to evade environmental protection laws and stuff like that. After World War II, Guam's value to the United States ebbs and flows. It reaches peaks during Vietnam, and then after Vietnam, it begins to fall. When the war on terror begins, it peaks again. And so that's why Guam, for example, is on the list that the Bush administration put together of locations where enemy combatants could be kept, and the U.S. could make a case that U.S. and international laws do not apply to these people. So, of course, Guantanamo is, is on that list, and Guantanamo was the, the terrible winner of that. But Guam was on that list, too, 
because as an unincorporated territory of the United States, per the insular cases, the, Uni the United States government gets to turn Guam's inclusion in the United States off and off, off and on like a light switch. It gets to be included today. It gets to be excluded tomorrow. And it's not up to the people in the islands whether they would rather be closer to the United States, further away to the United States. Your rights belong to the U.S. Congress and the federal government. And so today, Guam is very important once again to the United States. Uh, one, one federal uh, or one follower of U.S. policy and security said that with Diego Garcia and Guam built up, the United States could run half the world from these two sites built up. And because of sort of the controversies around special sex, especially sexual violence, but Marines evading crimes in Okinawa, the US made plans to move thousands of those Marines from Okinawa to Guam. And there have been many protests in Guam about that. Um, one site was supposed to be an area for a firing range. It was a sacred area with, with artifacts, the remains of our ancestors. We protested it, there was lawsuits. And we eventually won, but the military moved to another area on island. And for the past few years, they have been using the pandemic as a reason to shield the public from what is happening, to use that as a way of obfuscating what they're doing, that at a time when everything was locking down and closing up, the military used that to sort of to run ramshod over their construction, push it through as fast as possible. Um, including possibly violating many of their own environmental protection and natural and historic preservation laws, destroying sacred areas, um, and then claiming afterwards that they did not know. And so this is where we are at today. Guam is in the middle of a lot of uh, Guam is called by U.S. military officials the tip of America's spear. And I do sort of a and it is a, it's an interesting sort of existence. Because for military commanders, the value is, of course, that Guam is close to all of these potential threats. It's right there on the edge where the United States wants to project force into Asia. Mm -hmm. But for those of us who live on the tip of the spear, it's always a very sort of anxiety-inducing existence. Because if North Korea says it's going to bomb Guam to get back at the United States, if Donald Trump or Joe Biden says they're going to push back against North Korea, you have to wonder does Kim Jong-un, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, do they consider Guam to be a part of the United States? Or do they consider Guam, like a spear of America, to be something America uses to defend itself, to secure its interests? And so that is why, you know, for me, in conversations like this, I always think that decolonization for the island, achieving a political status in which the people are sovereign, in which they have a choice over these sorts of things is essential. Because we are on the edge of Amer the edge of America in the Pacific, the edge of Asia, and we should be a bridge connecting East and West, sort of a center hub in the Pacific rather than the tip of America's spear. Sidus Masi, and thank you. This that was that was powerful. Um, next up, we have our speaker um, representing Cuba, Claudia de la Cruz, uh, is the co-executive director of the People's Forum. Uh, she was born in the South Bronx to immigrant parents from the Dominican Republic. Not Wakanda. Oh, no. <laughs> Who's from the Bronx here? <laughs> Thank God they're low tonight. Anyway. Uh, she is a popular educator, community organizer, and uh, um, oh, in her role as co-director at the People's Forum, Claudia is committed to contribute her experience and skills in the creation of cultural educational space for organizers, educators, and cultural workers and artists to continue producing, promoting, and uplifting the cultural traditions that nourish and strengthen our communities and our struggles towards social justice. For over 20 years, she has been committed to the movement building and has actively participated in collective grassroots spaces, particularly in communities of the Washington Heights and the South Bronx. <laughs> Jorge just read the long, long version of the bio, but I appreciate you, brother. How's everybody doing? I don't believe it. How's everybody doing? 
Are we talking about solidarity? Solidarity forever. Um, for as long as there is repression and exploitation, there will be resistance and solidarity. Do we agree? Yeah. All right. Um, so I was tasked with the huge task of representing Cuba. That's a, that's a tall task um, for many reasons. And I wanted to start with a quote from Simón Bolívar from 1829. We're talking about 1898. Simón Bolívar said this in, not, in 1829. He said, the United States appears to be destined by providence to plague America with misery in the name of liberty. Should I read that again? Just in case, for those in the back that didn't hear it. The United States appear to be destined by providence to plague America with misery in the name of liberty. And when he was talking about America, he was not talking about the United States of America. Because that's one country, not the continent. And the problem with the United States since its development is that it's thought that it is the continent and not a country within the continent. Um, and that's why I think it's important for us to think about, yes, the Treaty of Paris, but let's think about Manifest Destiny and the use of religion, theologian. That's the, that, that's the study. That's what I engaged in. The study of religion and the use of religion to justify extraction, war, death. The United States did that in an expansion um, and stealing territory from Mexico. And we need to remember. The Monroe Doctrine is going to be 200 years from that curse next year. And we need to remember that. The Monroe Doctrine said, America for the Americans, which means the Europeans need to get out of this continent. But when the U.S. was saying America for the Americans, it was actually America for the United States, the basis of imperialism. And so when we talk about the Treaty of Paris, is only one treaty amongst many other <laughs> things that the United States had already been establishing since the beginning of the 1800s, since the, the later part of the 1700s, actually, to be, to be able to establish itself as an empire. And it has continued to do that. How has or how did the Treaty of Paris impact Cuba? I think it's important to say, you know, if you go into Google, Google is misinformation all over the place. If you go into Google, it will say something like, it provided Cuba from the independence of the Spaniards. But we have to read like the footprint. <laughs> what it meant was that the US military occupied Cuba. And then after that occupation came the Platt Amendment. Does anybody know what the Platt Amendment meant? The Platt Amendment gave the United States the authority to override Cuban authority, which means that even though Cuba had its government, the United States had power over Cuba. And it had the right to territory and to their natural resources. So it wasn't that the Treaty of Paris liberated Cuba. It actually did a transfer of power from Spain to the US. Now, I say that because it's important to understand that the, the, the obsession that the United States holds towards Cuba did not start with the Socialist Revolution of 1959. It did not start there. The struggle has been won over national liberation on the end of the Cubans. It has been won for sovereignty and won against imperialism. And that, that continues to be the case today. So Cuba has been fighting colonialism and imperialism for many, many years. And that is the case for the continent of the Americas. The United States utilizes and understands the rest of the continent as its backyard. That's Puerto Rico. That's Cuba, that's the Dominican Republic, that is Haiti, because we have to remember Haiti. And Cuba is to us today what Haiti was to slaved people in 1804. And so to maintain Cuba under the boots of imperialism to the United States means an ideological, political, and also economic battle 
is not only contesting territory, is not only contesting uh, the, the possibility of extracting, but it's also killing any possibility ideologically of people seeing Cuba as a reference for liberation. And so, you know, I was also asked to talk about the blockade because I was already given the two minute I could preach. Um, in 1959, the revolution wins. It's a national liberation struggle. It is not named a socialist revolution till after the Bay of Pigs. And it was very descriptive. What do you guys feel about agricultural reform? Everybody's jumping around when Fidel said that. <laughs> How do you feel about free education? Everybody's jumping around. How do you feel about healthcare and access to healthcare? And that's when he claimed in 1963 that the socialist revolution of Cuba was all of those things that people had access to that they didn't have access to before because Cuba was little Las Vegas in the Caribbean for the mafiosos and the United States government. Mm -hmm. And they establish a blockade that has been there for 60 years. And what it does is that it blockades any business with Cuba. It affects all aspects of life of the Cuban people. Every sector of society is impacted by the blockade. Education, people don't have access to the technology they need. Medicine, people do not have access to things that are not produced for healthcare. And under the Trump administration, there were 243 articles that were, were newly placed on Cuba. And there was blocking of people actually getting respirators. So when we're talking about the blockade, we're talking about human lives that are impacted every day. Shortages of oil, so people don't have fuel. And so when we talk about this legacy, I got you, I see you. When we talk about this legacy, of colonialism and imperialism is not something of the past. And it's also something that impacts people in the United States under a blockade that has impacted the economy of Cuba to the point that it's $15 million a day. Do you know what $15 million a day and what a country could do with that? And a country that is the size of Pennsylvania at that, what they could do with $15 million a day over $200 billion over 60 years. And the United States has the audacity to say that the Cuban government is the one that is actually not allowing the people of Cuba to live when they have their butt on the neck of the people. And so when we talk about the United States, Cuba has developed medicine, vaccines around diabetes that could be useful in our communities, black and brown communities that are dying because of the rates of diabetes. We could be using those vaccines. Under a blockade, Cuba made five different vaccines. Five different vaccines. And when we were thinking about vaccinating kids, they had already vaccinated most of the population that were under the age of five. So again, when we think about the blockade and what it does, it doesn't only blockade Cuba, but it blockades us to be able to advance and learn from a country that has had to use their revolutionary creativity to survive under the boot and attack of imperialism. And so I'll leave it at that. I'm sure there will be more opportunities to talk more. Thank y'all, Ari and Jorge, <laughs> and everyone. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I love listening to talk about Cuba. Um, <laughs> it like, I literally get like goosebumps. I was like, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot. Obviously, we're going to talk about it more. I think Cuba represents, especially for the three other nations that we're talking about today, a viable solution, a viable way forward. And Fidel, Che, I mean, the rest of the revolution is super important to this conversation. Um, but before we get to our questions, I want to talk to our last panelist. So our, our final panelist of the evening is Rafa Augusto Miranda. He's one of the founding members of New York Barrico Resistance and the Barrico Resistance Alliance. As a member of NYBR, <laughs> as a member of NYBR and as a steering committee member of the Puerto Rico Not for Sale campaign, he has been dedicated to bring forth the current issues of settler colonialism in the archipelago. As a group, we are led. Oh, I'm now speaking as if I am in NYBR. Um, 
The NYBR is led by the following set of guiding principles and demands, which are decolonization, international solidarity, diaspora struggle, and liberation as a human right. So without further ado, Rafa. Thank you very much. Uh, you know the Puerto Ricans are in the building when you start to hear huepa. So um, if you're still awake and you're still with us, please say huepa. Huepa. All right. Um, it is really hard to summarize 500 years in five to seven minutes, but we're going to give it a shot. Um, so just to talk really quickly about what was happening in Puerto Rico in the time leading up to uh, the Treaty of Paris. Right, we're colonized like everybody else here by Spain at this period, um, starting in the 1500s. Uh, what's important to note is that Puerto Rico, from the very beginning, was a, mili was a strategic military outpost. That was its main, um, its main uh, use okay, by Spain. In fact, what happened was when Spain came, they were like, okay, there's gold, cool, right? Like they did everywhere. However, when they realized that the gold uh, had depleted, and they saw that places like Mexico, places like Peru, had more gold, they were like, we don't want to be here anymore, we want to go to where there's more wealth. To the point that the Spanish government had to pass a law that if they tried to leave their post in Puerto Rico, they would get their limbs cut off, okay? Um, and so, really, why, why was that? Was because Spain was like, we need to use Puerto Rico to protect ships that are coming back from these gold-rich countries back to Spain, from pirates in the Caribbean. Pirates in the Caribbean was a real thing, okay? It's not just a movie, all right? So um, that's really what it was used for. This leads to severe, severe underdevelopment in Puerto Rico. Um, the kind of uh, uh, development that you saw in some of the wealthier colonies, you do not see in Puerto Rico. In fact, um, there is an envoy who goes named O'Reilly in like the late 1700s to PR. And he talks about how Puerto Rico is one of the poorest colonies in the Western Hemisphere at this time. Um, because it just was not, it didn't matter uh, in terms of development in the way that other colonies matter. Now, it did have some cash crops, but it was mostly um, illegal uh, trade that was happening between the Caribbean. Because the only place that you could legally trade as a colony of Spain in the Caribbean was with Spain. Um, so that's what we're dealing with at that time, all right? By 1868, after the success of the Haitian Revolution, shout out to Haiti always, okay? Uh, give it up for Haiti. Um, and after the wars of independence throughout the rest of Latin America as well, and after centuries of revolts that have been led by enslaved people in Puerto Rico, uh, you really begin to have the formation of a Puerto Rican national identity that is fully linked also to the abolition of slavery movement that's happening right then in Puerto Rico at that time. All right, so Betances, who's known as the father of the independence movement, was a staunch abolitionist and had been exiled, actually, uh, during the time of Grito de Lares, which we'll talk about, um, because of the work that he had been doing around abolition. Um, something else that I want to note is that as this leads to the plan of Grito de Lares, which is an armed uprising against Spain for more autonomy within the archipelago, this was heavily linked to uh, solidarity with the rest of the Caribbean, including the Dominican Republic and including Haiti, all right? And so when you see the Lattes flag, it looks very similar to the Dominican flag because the Dominicans were giving us arms. They were giving us uh, supplies for the uprising. So there's always been solidarity between the Caribbean nations, uh, even going as far back as Grito de Lares, okay? And Betan says he believed that there needed to be something called an Antilles Federation, which was uh, uh, working together of the Caribbean nations to support one another. Um, however, that armed uprising is squashed, um, but a couple of its demands are met later on, such as the abolition of slavery a few, a few years later. On November 25th, 19, 1897, Spain grants a charter of autonomy to Puerto Rico, giving them the right of self-government. The first elections are held in March 1898, but this is short-lived because by April 1898, the United States invades Puerto Rico. Um, Michael from, from Guahan had shared a little bit about the insular cases and being an unincorporated territory. That also affects Puerto Rico. We are also an unincorporated territory. We are also uh, impacted by the insular cases. And so at this time, we have multiple imposed military governors on Puerto Rico up until 1900 uh, when a civilian government is implemented. However, the civilian government is really imposed by the US. It's US people coming to govern Puerto Rico. So it's not a big difference. And so the first of these civilian governors, governors is uh, Charles Herbert Allen. And he's a big sugar tycoon. 
And so what he winds up doing is um, forming later the Domino Sugar Company and taking over all of the land in Puerto Rico, most of the arable land in Puerto Rico, and converting it into sugar plantations. Um, a few years later, you have the Foraker Act, which is passed, and this creates the role of a resident commissioner. The resident commissioner role still exists today. It's elected by the people of Puerto Rico to represent them in US Congress. However, they're not allowed to vote in Congress. And in this first year, they weren't even allowed to set foot in Congress. So how are you gonna represent a people when you can't even vote and you can't even enter Congress, right? In 1917, you have the Jones Shafroth Act, which is passed. And this is where we have citizenship imposed on us. And we say imposed because Puerto Ricans did not want citizenship, okay? And why were we granted citizenship? It was because we were about to enter, not us, but the US was about to enter World War I. And so they wanted not only to be able to draft us, but they also wanted to protect the Panama Canal. And so they said, well, Puerto Rico's in a very strategic place to protect the Panama Canal from what's happening in Europe. Um, thank you. So uh, they also built a bunch of military bases around the archipelago, including Culebra and Vieques, all right? And um, in about the 1920s, you have the establishment of the Nationalist Party, which resists a lot of these things. And then in the 1930s and 40s, you have Industrial Incentives Acts, which are passed, also known as Operation Bootstraps, which industrializes Puerto Rico, and it gives incentives to US corporations to come and build factories. Now, in order for this plan to succeed, they needed one million Puerto Ricans to leave the island, because they said that the only way that it would succeed was if they had Puerto Ricans to leave because the reason for poverty was overpopulation in their eyes. This also caused for the sterilization of one-fifth of all Puerto Rican women in the archipelago. Um, so just to fast forward really quickly, this is some pictures of Puerto Rico from 1920s to the early 1940s. This is when it's much more agricultural. Um, this is the mass exit of the one million that had to leave for Operation Bootstrap to succeed. Okay, so the federal government said, jobs await you in New York City, and that's why, if you ever wondered, why are there so many Puerto Ricans in New York? This is why, all right? Um, you do have an armed uprising in 1950. I hear you, thank you. Uh, you do have an armed uprising in 1950 by the Nationalist Party, where you see the stars. That's kind of where um, they were resisting. That's some pictures of that. These are some of the different groups that have resisted, not all of them, but a lot. This is the resistance of Vieques. This is what they took over in Vieques. And these are some different resistance that are happening right now, which I'm sure we'll get to in a bit. Thank you. All right, can we get another round of applause for our panelists, please? Hope y'all are ready, because now it's where it gets difficult. <laughs> we had some, a uh, little bit of questions drafted uh, beforehand. Kind of wanted to ask uh, for the panelists here, and then we're going to open up to the audience. If anyone all has questions, we'll have uh, someone with the mic to come around. Um, but just to start off here, um, it's kind of a loaded question, but let's get into it. Uh, what role has, like, U.S. and Western media played in your nation's history, uh, specifically, how has, you know, U.S. propaganda affected liberation movements um, back in these homelands? And we can start with, well, we don't have to go in order on this, so. Who wants to break the ice? Claudia? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I was just voluntold. <laughs> um... I mean, the role of U.S. and Western media, I think, you know, when we think about what we've been told on Cuba, Fidel Castro and the Cuban Revolution um, has been very intentionally uh, been a campaign of misinformation. Um, and again, blockading the narrative of Cubans who defend the revolution, who is the majority of the Cuban people living in Cuba. Um, who have understood that their task is to deepen the revolution and further the revolution and understand that it's not heaven necessarily, that there are contradictions that, that are there and that are a result of colonialism and imperialism because it, it, it was longer lived than the Cuban revolution. I mean, people have been alive for longer 
then the Cuban revolution has existed. And I think we need to contextualize it in that way. But when we hear the media, we hear that, you know, it's a, an authoritarian society. We hear the word regime. Um, right now, Cuba was placed in the list of states who sponsor terrorism. But we don't hear about Luis Corrales Posada, who lived in Miami and was very much supported by the CIA and was one of the biggest terrorists to ever hit and attack civilian people in Cuba. We don't hear about the brothers to the rescue. We don't hear necessarily that it is not the Cuban people that have control of Guantanamo, right? But it is the United States that actually does terrorist um, actions. And so we hear all these things in media because ultimately what they look to do is justify their actions against Cuba. Just like we're taught to, to ask the question, you know, if somebody gets brutally killed in our neighborhoods, a black and brown person, the first thing we ask is, what were they doing? And that, that it, we're trained to do that. And so it's the um, way of creating consent to then justify brutal actions against who the United States considers to be the enemies or the threat. And the reality is that Cuba has never threatened the United States. I just want to add, because I think that the black prop against Cuba is also very relevant to what happens in Puerto Rico, because, you know, there's a saying that uh, Puerto Rico and Cuba are two wings of the same bird. So there's also always been a relationship between Puerto Rico and Cuba. And, um, when people talk about independence in Puerto Rico, um, the first question that they ask is, do you want to become another Cuba? Do you want to become another Venezuela, right? Um, and so all the propaganda that you hear around Cuba and all the propaganda you hear around Venezuela um, is used to, to make people scared of independence. It's used to make people scared of their own liberation. Um, and it's really important to understand that. Um, I think that the FBI, and um, in, in, in 1948, we had a law passed called the gag law in Puerto Rico, which made it illegal for you to whistle or hum or sing the national anthem. It made it illegal for you to wave the Puerto Rican flag. That's why if you ever see us waving our flag, it's because we weren't allowed to for a few years, so we're going to take every chance we got, right? Um, and so it made it illegal for us to do that. It made it illegal for us to talk about independence. You had deep penetrating agents. I'm talking about family members who were spying on their family members. Um, you know, you can see all this actually because a lot of these FBI files has, have recently been released. And I encourage people, go read the FBI files because when you read it, it's, it's shocking to hear what they were doing to people. Um, and so I actually, Filiberto Ojeda Rios, who was the co commander of the Macheteros, an armed group that was fighting for the independence of Puerto Rico, uh, Filiberto Presente, um, he was assassinated in his house by 200 FBI agents in um, September 2005. And it was September 23rd, which is also the same date as Grito de Lares. Uh, so it was an important date for the independence movement. And it was a message. It wasn't, you know, by coincidence. They didn't just say, oh, this is a good day. They, they picked that day for a reason. And when you go into that community where his house is, the house is a museum now. You can go and you can see all the bullet holes and, and all the things that they did before, you know, to kill him. When you go into that community, that community still has a collective fear of what it means to struggle for independence, that it means that the FBI is going to come to your house, that it means that they're going to knock on your doors. And when I went to visit for the first time, another activist said to me, she was like, they don't even need to have an, an FBI agent anymore because just the idea that the FBI agent is always there is enough to scare people. And so that kind of repression is, I think, um, the most severe propaganda of all. So yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Michael? Yes. Yeah, um, it's interesting. Uh, thank you for bringing up that people in Puerto Rico worry about being uh, Cuba if they become independent. Because in Guam, people say that Guam will end up like the Philippines mm -hmm. if we become independent. And it's an interesting sort of uh, contradiction because um, it's far too expensive to go to the United States for health care mm -hmm. uh, all the way from Guam. So most people go to the Philippines for health care. And most people who have the means, you know, if you are first or second world uh, traveler, then the Philippines can be a very nice sort of segregated place for your experience. And so it's so fascinating for me in Guam when people say, you know, at, oh, we can't become independent because we'll end, like, end up like the Philippines. And by the way, 
my brother is getting married uh, next month in, in Manila. You should definitely come. And so it's uh, it's an interesting contradiction. In terms of the media, though, I find that, uh, you know, there's there's a handful of very old, very durable, you could call them imperial or you could call them colonial frames that media uses. And so, you know, for Guam, for example, it's um, a sort of a victim of a natural disaster. That's always important. Right. So that sort of invisible places rise when these frames can be dusted off and reused and you just kind of change the intensity of whatever hit them, how many people died this time, what was destroyed, and then just kind of file it off, file it again. Um, the other thing for Guam is, of course, that it is strategically militarily important. And so the media reports commonsensically, you know, when more troops get sent to Guam, when troops leave Guam as if sort of, you know, that's sort of what Guam exists for. And then another thing, of course, is uh, corruption, sort of that, uh, you know, is that empires love to warehouse their corruption in their colonies. They love to sort of say that it exists out there. Like, oh my goodness, can you believe what exists out there? And so um, that's why uh, sort of the media, the media frames that are used keep those things in place right so when is it that that the these parts of the empire or the former empire when is it that they connect to the united states oh well only when there are these problems when they are these scandals or when they are these uh these humanitarian disasters um i think um it's a little bit weird <laughs> in the Philippines um, because I think that historically we did see some of this like uh, very um, what we think of as um, the, the Western media like meddling or like changing how we think about like um, things happening in the Philippines. Right. Um, so like during the time of the Philippine American War, like um, Western media and U.S. media was reporting on it as the Philippine insurgency. And it was known as that for a very long time. Um, and, and so people, you know. Um, I didn't even know that there was a Philippine American war until I started, you know, organizing and that was like a whole thing. Um, after that, I think because of the way that the US has meddled in the politics of the Philippines for so long, um, they don't even really have to say anything anymore um, in that same way because it's already being disseminated on on its own, right? Um, so you see a lot of things like um, uh, people like uh, spreading falsehoods like um, in Philippine news, right? Because uh, politicians are saying it. So it's not necessarily coming from outside of the Philippines, you know what I mean? It's coming from internal. Um, and I think the, the last part of it is that um, more than uh, sort, sort of this like traditional uh, Western media like propaganda um, is that you see a lot of counterinsurgency um, that's really what we see in the Philippines. Um, this uh, counterinsurgency that has stemmed out of uh, this long history of uh, the U.S. collaborating with the Philippine state um, to um, crush uh, liberation movements or uh, you know any kind of like um, socialist or communist like thought. Right. Um, that's something that I like threw in at the very end because we're running out of time. But um, that's something that we're dealing with right now. Right. Is that um, we have a ton of misinformation being um, disseminated, um, not from US media, but from, you know, um, Philippine news or social media, uh, uh, telling lies about um, the um, National Democratic Movement, right? Um, or um, saying things like, you know, um, anyone from like, you know, activists, like, you know, uh, myself or like some of my um, Kasamas who live here, um, to like artists, like Mike was saying earlier, we just saw, you know, a peace advocate and a poet um, murdered by the Philippine state. Um, and people are still calling him a terrorist, right? Um, we see a lot of that kind of thing um, more than anything else. Yeah, and I think it's also worth noting how in this time period, in like particularly in the Spanish-American War, this idea of like the New York Times essentially picturing the war as like Puerto Ricans 
Chamorro people, Cubans, they're all captives, right? They're all half children, they're infants that don't know how to run their own country so that the U.S. is like framed as a liberator, as coming in and getting the house in order essentially, which is then like, I mean, you could look at it today, look at Palestine, you look at the former socialist world, like the former USSR, uh, these are all captives to communism, and the U.S. is going to come and give them all the resources that they've been missing for so long. Or even today in Iran, it's like this infantilizing of people and that the U.S. is going to just have to do the dirty work and come in and kind of put a government in place, essentially. Um, and then here at home, we all clap and we say, like, yeah, we should go into Afghanistan and we should save the, the women and we should go do all these things. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot in that in just that idea and so, but to move on to our next question um i think the conversation about independence movements it normally excludes or in some sense diminishes the centrality of labor and resources um in a nation fighting for its sovereignty and i know for example i put it here like the philippines labor export is a huge part of the u.s presence in the philippines and has been but i guess in what ways does labor affect each independence movement? And I specifically, going back to what you were talking about, Claudia, uh, with the Cuban Revolution in the case of Cuba, which has actually seen a working class revolution in its recent history, how has labor uh, shaped Cuba's presence today in relation to the West? And honestly, globally, because, you know, I mean, we can talk about the doctors, we can talk about many different programs that Cuba does uh, in training people. Um, so, yeah, um, we don't have to start with you. I don't want for you on the block. Uh, Rafa, do you want to take this? <laughs> I don't know. I just, you know. Yeah, yeah well, it, well, it's in, fresh in my mind. Um, yeah, I think what's really great um, and what's really admirable is that um, every independence movement in the Philippines has been rooted in the struggle of the working class, right? Um, and part of that is because of, like, how much... Uh, labor has uh, been part of the conversation as to why the U.S. is there, right? Um, and also, like, why people like me are here now, right? Um, but, you know, even thinking about the um, the first movement um, for independence with the Katipunan, um, the vast majority of those people, if not all of them, were um, working class. They were, um, you know, poor laborers and peasants and farmers. Um, right now, currently, the uh, majority of Philippine society um, are peasants and workers. And so um, when we're talking about, you know, uh, organizations um, like Bayan, like going into communities and organizing those communities, um, those people are, who are going to be part of those organizations are overwhelmingly going to be peasants and workers. Um, and so um, as we move forward towards uh, and uh, towards sustaining this um, current independence movement that uh, exists in the Philippines, um, we have to be, you know, centering uh, the leadership of um, the working class. <laughs> Ari just goes like this, puts up, <laughs> puts up the eyebrows like, <laughs> next. <laughs> I feel you. Okay. Um, well, I think in the case of Cuba, it's important to say, you know, and, and I'll uplift what a lot of the Cuban people have been calling revolutionary creativity. The leadership have been, has been calling it that. Um, revolutionary creativity in the face of a blockade um, is, 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 it sounds sweeter than what it actually is. Um, it's actually making something out of very little. And I'll say very little because there's dignity in that. And so there's, there's a lot of dignity and little uh, resources um, to make ends meet. And when we're thinking about Cuba, we can think about the fact that they are one of the largest exports of doctors. <laughs> so while the United States having all the means it has, it exports death and war, you have this tiny little island in the Caribbean that has the commitment and the conviction to export health and solidarity throughout the world. So you think about probably $50,000, I mean 50,000 um, doctors um, to something like 35 countries, um, brigades that have been there already. So when Haiti was hit in 2010 um, with the earthquake, the Cubans were there already. You know, people were sending all sorts of aid when that happened, but Cuban medical brigades were there since early 2000s. We have uh, the International School of Medicine, 
in Cuba, um, where the Latin American School of Medicine, that um, actually receives international students from the poorest. The biggest delegation of medical students comes from Palestine. That's a, that says a lot, you know. Um, and yet the healthcare system is very, very harshly, is one of the most harshly impacted uh, sectors by the blockade, like I mentioned earlier. You could see, you know, after the fall of the USSR, Cuba is, experienced a special period, um, which was a period where there were very, very little resources for agriculture. There were very little resources for people to eat. Basically, and what Cuba did was develop urban gardens. What we now see here, like urban gardening as something cute and nice that we do in rooftops, Cuba did it out of necessity in the 1990s. Um, and it advanced uh, utilizing organic products as, as fertilizers because they didn't have access to purchase fertilizers. Um, and, and, and you could go on and on and on and on. I mean, the way in which the Cuban society is organized with the defense, um, the Comités de Defensa para la Revolución, the CDRs, and the block by block organization um, that provides and allows people, regular ordinary people, to participate in popular democracy and el the electoral process. Those are things that we're blocked from. Like we talk about community safety, that's Cuba's perception of community safety. Having the community invested in the development of the organization. That's, that's what a working class society does. That it places the working class people at the front and at the center. And even within a blockade, Cuba has had the, uh, the ability again to produce five different vaccines. You know, And it doesn't, again, little resources and little technology the blockade does something like if 10% of an equipment is made in the United States, they can't purchase it. They might have the money, but they can't purchase the equipment. And we're talking about equipment to be able to test cells, um, to advance their biotechnology. And even with that, Cuba had the capacity to develop five vaccines and not only develop them, but make them available, which is the other part. While the United States were hoarding, they were hoarding vaccines, and so was Canada, Cuba said, you know what? We're gonna, we're gonna export these and make them available to the people. So again, there's so much possibility if we, op if we were to open that exchange with Cuba, people to people and state to state, there would be so much that we could learn and, and actually receive from Cuba that it's incredible to think about it. I guess I'll do. I can, I can share a little bit. I mean, um, this is one issue where that has been very difficult in terms of community organizing in Guam. In fact, some of the first um, public direct protests actually are happen around labor in the 1940s, um, but they're almost completely forgotten or erased from our history. So a lot of it came down to um, Chamorros who were working for the U.S. Navy, um, you know, protesting the fact that they were being paid a third or a fourth of what a white person was being paid. Um, and in fact, um, some one protest happened alongside Filipino and African-Americans as well uh, over the fact that um, they were segregated in terms of where they were allowed to eat. And that sort of that if you were not white, then you had to eat in this area. Uh, this was in a this was in a oh, this was a Pan American hotel. And so you had to you had if you were not white, you had to eat in the kitchen. You couldn't eat in the restaurant where whites were allowed even though you were an employee of the company and sort of even uh, even stuff as simple as uh, people putting up signs saying uh, speak English only and then Chamorros at the time protesting or one famous example that my uncle told me about was when there was a break room for these people who worked in a machine shop for the Navy and one day a sign went up saying that donuts and coffee are for whites only and everyone walked off the job sort of immediately. And so these things happened in the 40s, right after the U.S. had kicked out the Japanese. Um, but they're almost completely forgotten in our history. And one of the reasons is because the United States has sort of built this strong dependency sort of towards the United States 
and that the military, um, both civil society, the private industry, but especially the military, brings in a huge amount of foreign workers to Guam, uh, primarily from the Philippines. And so sort of whenever there's any issues with the local workforce, it's just sort of this idea, well, you can always bring in Filipinos, you can always bring in Chinese, you can always bring them in as well. And so at a certain point, um, the, under the Bush administration, uh, not under the Bush, under the Trump administration, they actually squeezed out foreign workers for all civilian projects, but they sort of kept the valve wide open for military projects. And so it kind of... Uh, this also is compounded by the fact that labor organizing in Guam is sometimes racially coded. So there was one strong labor union. It was a teacher's union, but it was eventually broken because the perception was that it was a white union because it was filled with white contract workers from the United States who were teachers. And so the local, even local Chamorro leftists went against the union because of this perception that this is a white, you know, this, these are whites dominating the island. You know, they're going against our culture, against the community. They're not thinking about the children. They're just thinking about their pocketbooks. And so because of all of these issues, it's been very difficult to get any sort of any sort of critical mass around 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 labor issues. Um, thanks for bringing up that that point on the unions because we're also seeing similar situations in Puerto Rico um, and have been for a very long time. Um, this may ruffle some feathers, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, the AFL-CIO, and when we talk about the union, we're not talking about rank and file. We're talking about the bureaucrats who uh, lord over the union, okay? Um, the AFL-CIO has a history of separating and forming colonial unions within the colonies to separate and divide colonial workers, okay, colonized workers. Um, and this has happened in Puerto Rico for a very long time, and it's still happening. And one of the most recent examples is um, Luma. If you haven't heard about Luma, even Bad Bunny, it's so big that Bad Bunny has a video about it, all right? Um, Luma is an energy company, a Canadian US joint venture company that took over the power grid, privatized the power grid in Puerto Rico in June 2021. Immediately, it began to lay off the public unionized Uthier workers from Puerto Rico, all right? Um, workers who had been there for a very, very long time, they began to be laid off. What did they do? They brought in workers from the United States, unionized IBEW workers to bust the union in Puerto Rico and paid them double what workers in Puerto Rico had been being, been being paid, all right? Um, so this is a real issue that is happening right now, and I'll talk about it a little bit in the call to action, but... La Ruta de la Verdad is a, a coalition group made up of some of the workers as well as other groups that are fighting against the Luma contract, um, fighting for the, the reinstatement of these workers to their jobs, fighting for higher wages for these workers. Um, but it is a really important and kind of weird thing that we have to talk about is the way in which unions are used to divide workers in the colonies. And again, that's not against the rank and file, that is about the bureaucracy of the union, okay? Um, some other examples are that as Puerto Ricans were beginning to migrate to the United States in the 1900s, some of our work was in tobacco factories. And some of those tobacco workers would get newspapers given to them, and they would actually send support to the revolutionary forces in Puerto Rico at this time who were fighting uh, for independence. So that's a really cool way that um, workers were integrated into this. You also have the sugarcane worker strikes, which were led by the Nationalist Party um, under Pedro Albizu Campos. Uh, they were so successful that it actually was what brought the sugar industry down and what made them say, we have to industrialize because we can't pay these workers more money to do the work that they've been doing, so we're going to industrialize and kind of change the game up. Um, and most recently, uh, you know, we're just continually, it's really lack of opportunities. Our youth are leaving every single day because there's nothing for them in Puerto Rico. Our, our best and our brightest are being forced to come to the United States. Um, and... That is a really important thing, and this is why we talk about why independence is important, because sovereignty is the only way that our people are going to be able to stay. Sovereignty, and when we're able to control what, what our resources are and how we want to spend them and how we want to use them, that's the only way our people get to stay in their homes. Um, most recently, there was the Somos Conference. If folks are not familiar, the Somos Conference happens every year in Puerto Rico. It's kind of a gathering of the democratic who's who, um, you know, party who's who and particularly Latin, you know, government officials. 
Um, most recently, Richie Torres, who is one of the representatives up in the Bronx, Puerto Rican representative, he signed an agreement with the Puerto Rican government uh, between the Bronx Department of Labor and the Puerto Rican government. Um, and so this is a way that we're gonna see uh, probably more and more of an influx of Puerto Rican workers coming through the Bronx, which we already know there is a big portion there, about 60% of Puerto Ricans in New York City live in the Bronx, um, but we're gonna see more and more being pushed out. And so, um, you know, those are important things for us to know as we're organizing among the diaspora and also as we're organizing in the archipelago. Thanks. Yeah, th thank you all the panelists for answering these questions. Um, I know this is a heavy topic, um, but now we want to open it up to the audience for a Q&A session. So if you have a question, just raise your hand, the mic will be passed on. Does anyone uh, want to say a little bit about how um, uh, either debt or currency play a role with regards to uh, underdevelopment or soft? Obviously, it's a huge topic, but I'm just curious what uh, what you have to say about those issues. Debt and currency. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite topic. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, can I jump into Puerto Rico? Go for it. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I think there, there were mechanisms that were created post-Cold War. Um, the IMF, you know, um, the World Bank. Right now, places like Argentina have crashed economies. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what's happening in Argentina, you should because their VP just got law fared out of her position. Um, you have Puerto Rico, which is a colonial debt. It's not a debt of the people of Puerto Rico, right? It's the, the actual colonial status of Puerto Rico that has created a debt. And so when you think about Cuba, for example, um, you know, the, the National Liberation Struggle won its revolution in 1959. And the price of freedom is the debt that the U.S. is trying to collect. So we need to kind of see things not only in the economic realm, you know. When we think about Venezuela and the sanctions, you know, the United States has actually pirated, it's stolen their money um, from European banks from U.S. banks. And so when we think about the ways in which the United States and its forces and its allies have strangled economies, that has definitely been won. The currency right now in Cuba, for example, is an issue, right? Because th there's no way of actually working with U.S. dollars. So a lot of the transactions that are being made in Cuba right now are with euros and the, the Cuban peso. Um, which creates an issue for Cuba in terms of being able to work in a world where the U.S. dollar still reigns, right? Um, so again, I think that there's, there's levels to it. Um, looking again at the IMF, at the World Bank, looking at the stronghold that the United States has in world economy, and also the fight for its continuous like, dominance over that because they're fighting China tooth and nail. Um, and, and so we have to keep our eyes open in terms of geopolitics and, and how things are playing out and um, seeing what's happening in Latin America in terms of like national debts and how the U.S. is coming to collect. I guess since you started with talking about Puerto Rico, I'll just jump in. Uh, it's really hard to talk about Puerto Rico and not talk about debt. <laughs> um, and I think it's important to note where the debt started. Um, the debt started in the 1950s, 1940s actually, when you had the Incentives Act uh, passed, which gave major incentives to US corporations to come into Puerto Rico and set up shop. Um, now obviously this brings some wealth, but they also aren't paying tax, right? So that tax base is not being developed. So by the 1990s, okay, so that gets signed in the 1940s, people have some tax breaks, there's like this boom a little bit, right? The 1990s, what happens? NAFTA gets signed. And so Clinton says, 
we're going to cut these tax breaks that are happening in Puerto Rico. And the corporations say, great, we're going to go to Mexico, right? Um, and you have this massive exodus out of Puerto Rico. Now, that massive exodus combined with no tax revenue for years and years and years, for decades, leaves Puerto Rico with very little in terms of how they're going to continue to pay for the infrastructure that they currently have. So what winds up happening is that the government starts to sell bonds to Wall Street. And these aren't just any old bonds. These are bonds with the highest predatory rates attached to them. Okay? And the banks and Wall Street, all of that is coming to collect. And so this really is what causes the debt crisis that we are at today, which brings us to seven, $70 billion is what they say that we owe. But I want to just break down some things. Um, some people may not be aware, but Puerto Rico is a major pharmaceutical hub for U.S. pharmaceutical companies. All the major pharmaceutical companies you can think of, PR is a major place for that, okay? Do you know how much those pharmaceutical companies combined with some of the other U.S. manufacturing companies uh, kind of don't pay to Puerto Rico in taxes? Do you know how much Puerto Rico gets misses? Over, like, over $100 billion, okay? So if they paid us, then the illegal debt would already have been paid, right? So technically, it's not our debt, it's their debt, all right? Um, and so this has led us to the situation where in 2016, right, PROMESA was signed under uh, President Obama, which appointed and imposed this fiscal control board. Um, this fiscal control board has power to veto the, government, the, the elected governor's decisions, all right? It is the ruling, uh, uh, um, it is the ruling class in Puerto Rico, all right? It is only the fiscal control board. OK, um, and so we have seen massive austerity measures. The Luma contract that got signed is one of what they have done. Um, they have been fighting for pensions to be cut to the workers. Um, they are the the buck ends with them. So, yeah, it's really hard to talk about Puerto Rico and not talk about that. Thank you for that question. Um, I think that when we talk about the Philippines um, and finances and the economy, um, we always like ha also have to talk about like the role of uh, the labor expert policy and the diaspora, right? Um, the A huge part of the labor expert policy um, that was instated under the first Marcos um, was to bring in more income uh, for the Philippines, right? Um, the uh, labor expert policy was used um, to create these uh, migration fees uh, that were used to uh, line the pockets of the government, um, but also uh, the, remitt the remittances that were sent back, right, um, from these um, workers in the diaspora. Um, and that still uh, persists today, right? Um, the Philippine peso is uh, tied to the US dollar, and so uh, the American dollar goes much further in the Philippines. Um, that's something that I grew up hearing a lot about. Um, and I think that every Filipino in the U.S. and probably anywhere outside of the Philippines um, is aware that, uh, you know, the money that we send back to the Philippines goes much further than anywhere it would go for us here, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's like a big thing. I think also uh, thinking about the ways that um, the Philippines has been forced to take out loans um, similarly to what other people have said, right? Um, particularly post-World War II, um, after the Philippines was sort of uh, decimated in a lot of ways, um, has forced the Philippines to remain in a constant state of um, underdevelopment and in a state of debt, right? Um, and I think the last part of that also is um, thinking about how uh, absolutely ridiculous it is that the Philippines is forced to import so much um, right, the Philippines, like I said, is an incredibly uh, resource-rich um, place. Right, um, theoretically, we should uh, we have everything in the Philippines that uh, should exist to sustain a people. Um, but so many people in the Philippines are starving. Um, so many people in the Philippines don't have access to things like you know uh, medicine. Um, we have all of those resources that um, are necessary to make those things. Um, but because um, the Philippines has to remain in a state of underdevelopment in order to, you know, um, benefit um, these imperialist countries, um, 
you know, this has persisted for, for decades, right? Um, basically since the, you know, Spanish first arrived. I think Michael hopped off of the Zoom. <laughs> Makes so. um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we're kind of running against the clock here. We want to get people out at a good time. But um, before we uh, bring into Nico for our closing number tonight, uh, I want to just go to any call to action that you all have, any sort of, you know, things that we can all support, we can show up to at different actions with people that are here. So, yeah. Well, I mean, how many folks have phones? <laughs> okay. Put your phones out and you're going to go to a website that is letcubalive.com it should be. Hopefully it is .com and I'm not getting this wrong. .org. There you go. So the letcubalive.org um, is an ongoing campaign uh, in support of Cuba. And we do work around the blockade. Um, and also, you know, in the instances of like Cuba has suffered the hurricanes, it has suffered the explosion of a hotel, the explosion in Matanzas. It's like so every time there's something that's happening around Cuba, we put out the alert in support of the, the Cuban people. And so just, you know, keep track of that. We have a campaign against again against the blockade and the lifting, the immediate lifting of the blockade, but also to get Cuba off the states that sponsor terrorism list, which um, includes uh, like a lot of more uh, prohibitions for business and work with Cuba um, from the U.S. in terms of sanctioning other countries that could be providing some sort of solidarity to Cuba. Um, and then, I don't know, Kate was doing this. Okay, letcubalift.info. Let Cuba you see, things change rapidly. The only constant thing <laughs> is change. So letcubalift.info. Um, again, end the blockade, get Cuba off the terrorist list, and also free Guantanamo. Those are the three things. <laughs> Um, yeah, so a few things. Uh, one is, if you can, again, take out your phone, go to your Instagram if you have one, look up PR Not For Sale, that's the handle, and please follow the Puerto Rico Not For Sale campaign if you're not yet. Um, additionally, if you want to join the campaign, come and see me afterwards. Um, also, follow New York Puerto Rico Resistance, there's the handle right there, and, uh, and join us. If you want to join around Puerto Rican organizing, please join us. Um, it's not enough for us to just talk on panels. We really have to be organizing in our communities regularly. And so if you are not part of an organization, I strongly encourage you to get to be part of one. Um, donate to La Ruta de la Verdad, which is a coalition fighting against Luma Energy. Um, and so that's the Venmo information and the PayPal information. Whatever you can give will definitely help. Uh, something I did want to talk about um, is that recently a group in Puerto Rico, a Cuban Solidarity Brigade called La Brigada Juan Ruiz, uh, Rius Rivera, um, went to Puerto Rico. I mean, went to Cuba. When they came back, they were all visited by the FBI. Um, and they had the FBI knock on their doors, give them phone calls. Uh, and there is, um, you know, this sense that, es that political repression in Puerto Rico is continuing to escalate. Um, and so just please pay attention to what may happen and any calls to action that may came, come out of that. Lastly, that's not up here. Uh, we have a fundraiser on Sunday with Malaya Movement. If there's any members of Malaya Movement, hey, hey. Um, from 1 to 5 p.m. at Project Reach, 39 Eldridge Street. It is elevator accessible. Uh, so please, if you would like to support um, and continue to build solidarity, we would love to see you there. And this performance that you'll see later will be, it's just a taste of what is to come um, that day. looking for the screen to change. Anyway, um, yeah, we're on social media. Every, well, Filipinos are on social media. Um, <laughs> we we got to stay connected. Um, so, you know, um, you can follow uh, on Instagram, buyin.usa.ne. Um, we have a link in our bio to sign on to a letter um, demanding justice for Eric Sonacosta, um, who Mike mentioned earlier. Um, I also, my own organization is on Instagram, at Anak Bayan Queens. Um, yeah, we're all, we're all here. 
<laughs> um, and we have a link in our bio there um, to a lot more resources um, if you want to learn more about what's happening in the Philippines, um, as well as a link to a free zine um, that was created by Anak Bayan USA um, explaining um, workers' struggles and triumphs um, in the Philippine diaspora. Um, I think that, you know, um, like I said, there's like so much like um, willfully wrong information trying to smear our organizations um, that is coming out of the Philippine state. So it's incredibly important to stay um, plugged into uh, organizations and people who are um, really telling the truth about um, the state of the Philippines, right? Um, I think also what's really great is that we have an incredibly robust uh, progressive Filipino movement here in New York. Um, and so there are many places that you can plug in to get organized, right? Um, we have um, Bayan, um, which is um, an alliance of Filipino, progressive Filipino organizations, um, including um, Anak Bayan, um, Gabriela, which is the women's movement, um, Migrante, uh, which is the migrants movement, um, and we also um, have uh, other allies who are um, also doing progressive uh, work in the Filipino community, um, such as Malaya Movement and NYCHIRP. So, you know, check us out. All right, one more round of applause for our panelists, please. All right. So to close out the night, we'll have a cultural performance here by both Nico and Eamon. Uh, they're both members of, one is a member of New York Resistance, the other the Malaya Movement New York, respectively. <laughs> Although they met as two friends finding their way along their journey as students, they've rekindled as comrades within their respective grassroots organizations. That's sweet. Aww. Nico wrote that. Okay, we're, we're good to go. <laughs> We've been Spoke. We don't, we don't want to hear, we don't want to hear. Um. Oh yeah, this is, this is uh, when the nerves start hitting. Let's be, let's be nervous together. Ah, ha, ha. <laughs> um, okay, well, look, I'm nervous, so I think, uh, we should just start by grounding ourselves. You know, we're in a space of love and community and um, we've talked about really uh, powerful and also devastating and hurtful things. Um, so you don't have to close your eyes if you don't feel comfortable. Um, I will be closing my eyes and maybe we could like breathe in for four, hold our breath for seven and then, you know, for eight. The other thing you do, exhale. The word is exhale. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Okay, so here we go. So, breathing in, holding, and letting go. Okay. Como tu está mi gente? How are we doing? Yes. Um, yeah, I thought that would help, but I'm still nervous. It's okay. Um, I just want to say, um, and Eamon, if you have any words to say to, please feel free to take this away from me, you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know do words either. <laughs> um, 
But I think Eamon uh, will agree when I say we are very grateful to be in this space with all of our comrades and Kasamas. And I see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of new faces. And I'm looking forward to seeing these faces again. Um, I'm feeling very moved right now in this space. Um, and, you know, just for transparency, um, you can ask Rafa, um, but um, that, that Rafa right there. <laughs> um, I don't know if the live stream could see, but <laughs> uh, I'm very uh, self-critical and very highly um, in my head about being a cultural worker um, in service to the masses and in service to the movement work and in service to international solidarity. Um, because, you know, as cultural workers, uh, however you define it, a musician, an artist, you know, y toda la mierda, um, <laughs> it, uh, you don't want to replicate petty bourgeois, like, ideals of art that are not going to be in service to the masses. Um, but, you know, when you're, like, growing up in this system, those are the, como que, norms and expectations that you develop. Um, so I'm very self-critical. I'm always questioning if I'm doing right by the movement and by um, our people. Um, but I feel like um, this is a good thing. And if you agree, maybe you can make some noise. So I'm like, oh, hey, cool, cool, cool. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you. I feel grounded. Um, so I'm here with Eamon. And Eamon and I are good friends. Um, at least I like to think so. <laughs> um, we met maybe like through, no, even more than three years ago, maybe like, and so was I. So we were like your third year, it was my first year, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and then I joined NYBR in 2019, and then Eamon joined Malaya pretty recently, right? Yeah, 2020. So it was just like, we knew each other as friends, and then we were like, oh shit, we're doing music, and we're involved, and I was like, yo. Um, and I think that's really important, and I think that's really significant to say, and, and a testament to why we're here, because it's, you don't just do one thing, right? You know, we're multifaceted, um, we have many hats and roles to play in the movement, um, and it's not enough to just be like, oh, I'm gonna make, you know, art or what whatnot, um, and not, try to root it in the mass work or also be like, okay, maybe the guitar is not what needs to be picked up today. Maybe it's the machete or maybe it's the megaphone. <laughs> That's what, <laughs> what Rafa would say. <laughs> um, you know, maybe it's the megaphone or maybe it's the, you know, um, the spoon to feed, you know, yeah. Um, and so I, I just want to really ground and like, you know, yeah, we, we know each other as friends, but we also play music because it feels good, um, but it's not just enough to feel good. It's also making sure it's rooted in the mass organizing. Um, and I'm really grateful for the comrades who helped me find that realization and, and have that learning. And also Carlo, who's like in the back, who's also helped me learn those things. And the Kasamas for helping me learn those things. Um, so we're going to play a song. It is one of a few songs that we will be playing for the Noche de Primexes, NYBR Cross Malaya, uh, Philly Rican Noche Buena on Sunday, uh, December 11th from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. at Project Reach. Um, and the song is called Viva Puerto Rico Libre. It is by Ghetto Brothers, uh, which, you know, again, all love to the South Bronx where I'm born and raised. Um, and Ghetto Brothers, uh, one of their major contributions was trying to uh, unite the gangs um, that were in conflict, again, because we have our primary contradictions, which is, again, U.S. imperialism, colonialism, whatnot, and trying to educate the masses on, um, or with the masses, rather, uh, on those kind of primary contradictions. And so this song will talk about lamenting and sadness uh, and wanting, you know, Boricuas to wake up, but I want to use that as a message, rather, uh, for all of our united peoples um, to want solidarity, all of our united peoples to wake up together and defend what's ours and the land and the dignity of our people. Um, so I feel like I've talked enough. I think I'm going to get into it. 
and thank you. Yo tengo una isla en mi corazón Y esta isla mía está sufriendo mucho Viva Puerto Rico libre You want to sing along, you can Viva Puerto Rico libre Viva Puerto Rico libre. Viva Puerto Rico libre. Te estoy pidiendo la Latinoamérica que me soportes para ser la
I just want it on record. I love Eamon so much. <laughs> Wow, thank you guys so much. Yo, Nico, Eamon, thank you guys. That was amazing. That was so amazing. Uh, thank you guys for coming. Uh, we, yeah, we're like, <laughs> we are, we're right here, baby. Uh, A58, let's do it. Um, I just want to thank all the Kasamas, all the comrades, everyone who came out. I want to thank Jorge for moderating this with me. All right, so just to close out here, thank everyone for attending both here in person and virtually. The live stream's still on. Thank you on YouTube. Um, shout out again to everyone here. And just again, any donations, everything we see today is going to be for honorariums for all respective organizations that are on here. And some of the proceeds will also go towards LPS. Um, and yeah, if you really enjoy this, you know, show the love. Um, Vemo, Cash App, Zelle, what else we have? Yeah. Hard ha card cash. What else they got here? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> your Run coins your pockets. will take the chain. We'll no. take the change too. Uh, yeah, uh, Jay Saturai. Uh, we have the um, yeah the shirts. We have Mike's book is up there. We have stickers. Uh, if you want, leave your name, your email with us. If you're interested in joining Night Trip, NYBR, respectively, we are always orientating and helping new membership and want to grow our movements, obviously. And then if you do not feel you're right for our org, we have other orgs on our network that we would love to connect you with. Um, and yeah, uh, let's continue international solidarity. This doesn't have to stop on the day the Treaty of Paris was signed because, like, to be honest, fuck U.S. imperialism, and I don't want it to define why we're all meeting. Um, and then just a housekeeping thing. If you can, stack one chair into the next, and we can maybe leave in a timely manner. And thank you to the People's Forum for staying late. I appreciate you all yes. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.